Welcome to part one of a three-part video series that covers shaft vibration due to whirling behavior for shaft assemblies. This is a three-part video series. Today, the first part, we're going to introduce the basics of whirling behavior. What is it exactly? What are the underlying mechanisms behind it? In the second part, we're going to go through some practical analysis methods that you can use to predict whirling behavior for shafts that have uh, some practical complexity. Finally, in part three, we're going to go through a more detailed shaft whirling example. I assume before going through this that you have some background in basic mechanical vibration and also elastic beam analysis. These are topics that we have reviewed in class previously. The first thing to point out is that shaft whirling behavior really is fundamentally different from vibrations we've talked about before that are described by the wave equation. So let's start off with a quick review of the wave equation. Wave behavior described by the wave equation involves transmission of energy through a medium without net mass movement. It involves oscillation between uh, two forms of energy, for example, mechanical kinetic energy and elastic or gravitational potential energy. Waves can be transverse or longitudinal. And in this course, they are relevant to us because of things like resonant behavior in springs and shafts or other components that have natural frequencies. Resonance and vibration are important failure modes that we need to understand and have the quantitative tools to predict so that we can design our systems against failure due to these modes. Here's a review of the general wave equation. Uh, this form is based on a vibrating string. Imagine we have a string with some tension in it that's held between two points and it can vibrate. This partial differential equation uh, describes W, the transverse displacement of the string, as a function of position along the string X and of time. Uh, some of the important quantities here include the static tension tau of the string, rho is the string density, and A is the cross-sectional area. It's possible to show that the natural frequencies of this string are governed by this formula. And we can get some intuition here for the behaviors of the string vibrating as different things change. For example, if we increase tension, that increases the natural frequency. If we increase length, that decreases natural frequency. And if we increase mass, that's going to decrease natural frequency. Mode shapes are uh, important for vibration analysis. We can describe the mode shapes for a vibrating string using this equation. And one way of answering what a mode shape is, is if we were to take the string and hold it in the exact position of one of its mode shapes and release it, the string would vibrate at the corresponding natural frequency, and it would maintain this shape. The magnitude would vary with time, uh, but that's one way that uh, we could achieve this type of vibration in a, a spring. Uh, this kind of behavior uh, mathematically is very similar to solving for stable buckled shapes in columns that are under compression. Uh, and solving for the critical load that would cause buckling for these columns. So there are a few different important types of waves. Transverse waves are those where the displacement of particles is perpendicular or orthogonal to the wave motion or the direction of energy transfer. The vibrating string is an example of a transverse wave. Longitudinal waves are different in that the particle displacement is aligned with or parallel with the wave motion or the direction of 
energy transfer. So for example, if we had this series of masses and springs uh, vibrating, this is an example of a longitudinal wave. Uh, you could think of this as a simplified model of a slinky. It can transmit waves longitudinally like this, and it has both uh, mass and stiffness uh, distributed throughout it. Here's an animation of a violin string vib vibrating, so obviously a transverse wave. Here's a video of a longitudinal wave and a slinky. Okay, now let's talk about how shaft whirling behavior is different from these other types of waves. And what are the fundamental mechanisms behind whirling? So with any kind of mechanical shaft system, we're never going to achieve perfect balance, either static balance or dynamic balance of the shaft system. And if we have a rotating imbalance, we're going to have some inertial forces from centripetal acceleration. Uh, thinking back to your first course in physics and mechanics, we can quantify centripetal acceleration if we know the radius and uh, of a mass uh, rotating around a, a point and the angular velocity. Uh, one system you might have seen before that uh, describes this kind of behavior with a rotating imbalance or unbalance is described or illustrated in this bottom right figure. It shows a mass that has a, a distance E, uh, an amount of eccentricity, from the axis of rotation, and it's rotating with an angular velocity omega. But this particular system is constrained to only move in the vertical direction. And this rotating imbalance is going to result in a variety of forces, both reaction forces and forces on the springs and dampers that are shown here. And it's going to result in some dynamic behavior uh, and movement of this system up and down. So these kinds of forces from a rotating imbalance can cause undesirable vibration in a mechanical shaft system. In addition, this kind of behavior can lead to unstable dynamics. And we'll, we'll learn about under what conditions will uh, the dynamics become unstable. And of course, we want to avoid that. We want to learn how to design our shaft systems to avoid undesirable vibration. And we definitely want to avoid unstable dynamic behavior. So inertial forces that arise from an eccentric mass rotating about an axis of rotation will tend to push the shaft away from its axis of rotation. And I've tried to sketch that out here in this drawing. Uh, of course, it's exaggerated. But if there's an eccentric mass uh, attached to this rotating shaft, uh, as the shaft is rotating, uh, it, it may cause it to deflect away from its axis of rotation. And here I'm quantifying that amount of transverse deflection uh, with the symbol Y. So we have this tendency to push the shaft away because of these inertial forces, but we have something that balances it back. We have the bending elastic properties of the shaft, it's bending like a beam, and those are going to produce a restoring moment or force that pulls the shaft back into its original straight position. So we have these two competing things, and we need to figure out how they balance each other out. So we can calculate this restoring force if we model the shaft as a beam with transverse applied loads. Uh, you can either go through the fourth order differential equation and derive the results yourself for beam deflection, or you can go to table A9 in your textbook. This happens to be case five we're looking at and look up the formulas for these uh, different cases with different beams. 
So here we're going to be looking at a simply supported beam. Uh, so there can only be vertical forces in this case. We're going to assume we have two supports that do not uh, resist any kind of moments at the ends, and we have an applied transverse force right in the middle of this beam that has length L. If we uh, go to the formulas in table A9, we can see that the deflection of the center of the beam, uh, the transverse deflection, uh, that's equal to negative FL cubed over 48 EI, where F is the applied force, L is the length of the beam, E is Young's modulus, and I is the area moment of inertia. We can use this formula along with a linear model of a spring, F equals K times delta or deflection, to derive a formula for the stiffness of the beam. And when I say stiffness, think of it as you're pushing on the middle of the beam and it's going to deflect some and it's going to feel like you're pushing against a, a spring. And it's going to behave, at least initially, like it's a linear spring. As you increase the force, the deflection is going to increase proportionally with the force. So it's going to have some stiffness. And what is that stiffness? K, that's equal to force divided by the deflection. And using the formula above, we can uh, arrive at the stiffness being equal to 48 EI over L cubed. Whirling behavior depends on the balance between these inertial forces from the eccentric mass and the elastic restoring forces. In this sketch, this on the left-hand side, it shows uh, a cutaway view of the beam, uh, of the shaft behaving like a beam, and its deflection from its axis of rotation is quantified using y. And then looking at the end uh, of the shaft, uh, just to the right, um, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that because of the imperfect manufacturing, the center of mass is not going to line up perfectly with the neutral axis, the elastic neutral axis of the beam. And that offset, uh, this eccentricity, I'm quantifying uh, with the symbol E. So with this defined, we can now describe what is the restoring force in this particular case uh, accounting for the eccentricity. So the restoring force uh, is going to be equal to the stiffness times y plus e, not just y alone. And so the restoring force is 48 ei over l cubed times the quantity y plus e. The uh, inertial force, uh, if we assume all of the mass is concentrated at a lumped mass in the center of the shaft, we can say that the inertial force is equal to that total mass m times the angular velocity of the shaft squared. Another way of thinking about this is to think of some analogous lumped parameter models. So what I've been describing so far is illustrated in figure A, uh, where we have this mass in the middle of a shaft. And the elastic shaft, it has elasticity, it has compliance, but it has no mass. All the mass is concentrated in the, in the middle in this model. Another way of thinking about this is uh, imagine, as in figure B, uh, a rotating frame. It's rotating on some bearings, and there's no deflection in this frame at all, but it, we still have a lumped mass in the middle. And now we've concentrated all of the elastic behavior at a single location. There's a single degree of freedom in this model. So 
Uh, here, the diagram in figure B, that shows the mass being offset by an amount y from the original axis of rotation. Uh, so this might be a nice way of conceptualizing what's going on. You have this uh, mass. If it's offset at all, we're going to have uh, inertial forces uh, trying to uh, throw it away from the center. But then we're going to have the spring forces trying to return it to the center. And so the way it behaves really depends on the balance between uh, these two factors. Um, yet another simplified way of looking at it is figure C, where we have a single mass attached to the ground using a spring and an applied force that's equivalent to the inertial force, uh, and then the displacement y. So mathematically, uh, this would be the same uh, if the inertial force is uh, uh, analogous uh, to what we describe above. OK, so as a shaft enters into whirling behavior, it, it's possible to have several different modes of deformation. Uh, so if we have a shaft spinning at its first critical speed, we're going to get the behavior at the top. If we spin it even faster and get to the second critical speed, we're going to get the behavior where it looks like a full sine wave uh, at the bottom. So this behavior is governed by partial differential equations. Uh, for anything but really simple systems, these equations can be really difficult to solve. Um, here, my primary objective is to, to help you get a good foundational understanding of the, the mechanisms behind what's going on. But we're not in this class going to go through solutions of partial differential equations. Here we're going to look at simpler models, simpler analysis methods, um, both the really simple ones like we're looking at right now, uh, but also some uh, kind of intermediate models that uh, go beyond what we are quantifying here and allow you to predict the whirling behavior of more complicated shaft systems with multiple components on them um, without having to solve the partial differential equations. Here's an animation or a, a video of a whirling rope that is very similar in nature to shaft whirling. So we have the rope rotating and there are inertial forces that are going to tend to push the rope away from the axis of rotation but the rope has some tension that is pulling it back in and so we have these two counteracting factors and there's a balance between them and that balance is going to dictate the behavior of this whirling rope so when is shaft whirling important to consider? Uh, if we have long unsupported lengths of a shaft, then that's going to increase the compliance of the shaft and increase the propensity for whirling behavior. Uh, if we have low bending stiffness, uh, either due to long unsupported lengths or just due to a low stiffness material or a a uh, small diameter shaft that also will contribute to increased whirling behavior. Another is if we have significant inertias uh, attached to our shafts. So imagine a really large flywheel, for example. If it's in the middle of an unsupported length of shaft, that could be a situation that's very prone to whirling behavior. Okay, let's go through this initial model in a little bit more detail so we can understand the behavior of shaft whirling. Again, we're using a lumped parameter model where we are considering a single stiffness and a single mass. And here we've defined what is the restoring force due to the elasticity of the shaft, and then what is the inertial force. So what happens when these balance? What happens if we set these equal to each other? We can solve this for different variables. We can look at uh, the behavior and get some insights about what's going on. One question we can ask is, under steady conditions, what will the deflection, the transverse deflection, y be? We can solve for the neutral axis deflection. That's going to be equal to the level of eccentricity over 
uh, this quantity 48 EI over m omega squared L cubed minus 1. We can get some insight from this. Uh, there are a number of things to point out. If we have larger eccentricity, that's going to increase the deflection. If we have a stiffer shaft, so if we have a larger E or I, uh, that's going to reduce the deflection. If we have greater mass M, larger speed W, or a longer length L, uh, those are all going to increase the deflection. As we look at formulas like this, it's important to think both from a design and an analysis perspective uh, to try to get some new intuition and insights as you are developing your skill as a mechanical designer. So what are some implications of this model that we're using so far? We can look at another piece of behavior. So what happens as rotational speed increases from zero? Well, it might not be entirely intuitive just looking at this formula, what's going to happen. And so I've sketched out the behavior in this plot. The horizontal axis shows the rotational speed going from zero uh, at the left uh, increasing to the right. And then the transverse deflection, y, is the vertical axis. Uh, so what we see is that as the speed omega increases, the deflection increases in a nonlinear way. And actually, it asymptotically approaches infinity as the speed approaches a critical speed. And then if we were to pass that critical speed, uh, we would decrease and asymptotically approach eccentricity. So let's talk about the behavior. Why are we getting this critical speed? And why are we getting this uh, asymptotic decrease toward E as we increase speed even further? If we look at this formula, if we pay attention to the denominator, well, it's very possible that the denominator could approach zero. And that turns out to be what's happening as we approach this critical speed. So as the speed increases, uh, the denominator is approaching zero. And then that means the deflection is going to approach infinity. In our model, we are assuming we have a single mass, a single degree of freedom. Uh, this means we're going to have a single natural frequency. If we had multiple masses, multiple degrees of freedom, then we'd have multiple natural frequencies. So if we think of this as a natural frequency, uh, we can define uh, this natural frequency as a square root of 48 EI over ML cubed. And if we define that, uh, then we can re rewrite the formula for the transverse deflection y in terms of the critical speed. So it's omega squared e over the quantity uh, omega c squared minus omega squared. Uh, so if we define the critical speed as we have, uh, it's pretty clear that the denominator becomes 0 if omega is equal to the critical speed. So here's the other question I asked just a moment ago. Why does the deflection y decrease above omega c? Why does it asymptotically approach eccentricity e? Well, look at the denominator here and think about the sign of the den denominator. If omega is less than omega c, the denominator is going to be positive. If the denominator is positive, then y and e will have the same sign. If they have the same sign, they will, in essence, reinforce each other and amplify the inertial forces. What happens, though, if omega is greater than omega c? Then the denominator is negative. And that's going to mean that y and e have opposite signs. That means they're going to tend to cancel each other out. 
it's because of this that the inertial forces are reduced. And as we go above the critical speed, the deflection asymptotically approaches the eccentricity. Here's an example of whirling in a real application. This is a remote control boat propeller. It's a somewhat different setup with a cantilever beam, so it's not simply supported anymore. So the calculations would be different, but the uh, whirling behavior is very similar. So in just a moment, we're going to approach a critical speed here. So now you can see it wobbling around. This is the kind of behavior that we would expect if we hit a critical speed. And of course, note it did not, the deflection did not approach infinity. As deflections become large, the simple linear models that we're using become less accurate and other things come into play. So as we're slowing back down, we're going to pass through resonance again. You can see the shaft wobbling around. And it's this kind of behavior we'd really like to avoid. We want to design our systems so we don't get this whirling behavior. Uh, it can lead to catastrophic failure. It can cause different types of interference in the system. Uh, it can in increase forces in a system, and that can lead to other types of failure. So as we start wrapping up, I, I'd like to draw some parallels between shaft whirling and buckling. Uh, we covered buckling of long set slender columns and compression uh, very early in the class. And there are some interesting parallels here. When we look at columns, there's a balance between applied moment and restoring moment. So if we think of applying a compressive force to a column, and uh, if the column's perfect, an ideal column, then we're going to have a, a, a case where there's no uh, bowing out, no lateral deflection. But if it's imperfect, we're going to have some kind of eccentricity. And the column is going to start to move out uh, in the transverse direction. We're going to get some bowing out. And when that happens, with that uh, bowing out, that's actually a moment arm. And that's going to uh, create an applied moment uh, from the applied force and then this offset. But because of the elastic behavior of the column, there is a restoring moment that's going to resist uh, the applied moment. And so the buckling behavior of a column really has everything to do with this balance between these two factors. Similarly, with shaft whirling, there's a balance between these inertial forces and the elastic restoring force. And how that balance plays out is what is going to govern shaft whirling behavior. We saw in buckling, if we exceed a critical load, that can lead to collapse of the column. With shaft whirling, if we approach a critical, sp critical speed, shaft deflection, uh, at least uh, as described using this simplified model, grows without bound. And that's certainly something we want to avoid. Also in buckling, there is what we call an associated eigen problem. There also is one with shaft whirling. And in the next uh, video in this three-part series, we're going to discuss this Eigen problem. So to conclude here in this first part, we've introduced some basic concepts. Uh, what is shaft whirling? What are the underlying mechanisms? We've discussed some simplified whirling models. We've identified the presence of critical speeds and resonant behavior. And we drew some parallels to our previous analysis of buckling in columns. As we move forward into the next part, we're going to go through some practical whirling analysis methods that will allow you to predict what's going to happen with a shaft, a mechanical shaft assembly that has multiple components on it that's much more complicated than the types of things that we've covered so far. And then in part three, we're going to go through a detailed example. Thank you.